Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. This is a special edition of uh, the program. This is not actually a review. This is a manual introduction and a bit of a deep dive overview of the Higher Hertz Hertz delay. Yes, Higher Hertz. Higher Hertz is actually putting out a uh, delay product for any of you to use for free. Unfortunately, the limit on any is that uh, it has to be anyone who has a Windows computer uh, that will run a 64-bit VST 2.4 or VST 3. Sorry, no Apple. Uh, Apple just seemed to keep changing their system too much to, uh, to keep in touch with, at least at the moment. So let's take a quick overview. Here is a piece Now let's beautify it. Now the only mixing element, the only effect in here, other than drive for the guitars, uh, is Hertz delay. It is doing all the duties. And this device, I'll be honest up front, you, you work it out fast enough anyway. I designed and built this. Um, so another reason it can't be a review, uh, but it does mean that I've got the ability to give you a real in-depth as to how it, how it works. Uh, so very simply, on the surface, it can be used for a chorus. Uh, real sort of old style, analog or early digital style chorus. Uh, it will operate in a, a sort of a single mode, but it'll also operate in a multiple, what people commonly refer to these days as a uh, BBD, Bucket Brigade. So tape, Bucket Brigade, early digital style reverbs, all in there, depending upon how you set things up. It will also operate as a simple reverb. It's not going to give you those perfect modern uber smooth reverbs, it's not meant to, and, and nor do many classic recordings have such a reverb, but uh, you know anything that you can think of in terms of a chamber or a plate or something like that, you know, there's really nice, rough, characterful reverbs, uh, and we'll talk about that in the section as well as we go. Of course, it will handle echo duties, so very much in the tape delay kind of echoes, including multi-tap, so not just having the one, but having several, three to five taps, as in separate echoes coming back, and saturation. It will work as a saturator, which we will see as well. So a lot of uses out of the one device, hence the ability to take that rather flat sounding mix and make it not only wider, but deeper. The most important part is the deeper bit. So oh, the first thing that we have to look at is how to install. When you download, you'll get a zip file and in it there should be a folder that reads like this, the Hertz delay. Open that up and you will get two folders inside as well as the manual. The manual is a complete everything we've got, including explaining what we're looking at here. And there's a README, which again covers the basics of what you need to do to get started. Installation is a manual process, very much deliberately so. Um, I'm not a big fan of all the installs and what have you. Uh, you just need to know a little bit about how your system is working, and then you are golden. If they are both, as I've said, 64-bit plugins uh, of the VST variety, so running on Windows computers. If you are using a host that won't accept anything past a VST 2.4, like Reason, then you grab this whole folder. Do not open these folders, please. You grab the whole folder and you drag it into your plugins folder. That can be anywhere on your drive, anywhere that you've said to your host, whichever host it is, this is what you, this is the place you look to find VST. Drag the whole folder there, drop it in, restart your door, and you should find that appear. 
if you are wanting to use the VST3 version, which in theory you should, if you have the opportunity you use a VST3, in theory you should use that. So don't install both. If you can run the VST3, just install the three, unless you've got some reason to do otherwise. That has to go in a very specific folder under your PC, where your main OS is, which is commonly your C drive, program files, common files, VST3. So you drag this whole folder and you drop it into that folder because VST3 can only live in that folder. If you put it anywhere else, even if it's in your VST2 folder, your door will not find or use it. So again, make sure you drop the whole folder in. If you just drop the loose DLL in, the VST may open, but then you'll have no GUI. That makes it pretty darn useless. So you must pop in the whole folder. So that's installation done. Let's look across the board at what we've got. This reminds us that we have many duties that can be performed by the device because it's easy sometimes to just sort of forget and narrow down and do one thing. This is capable of doing a lot. Up to you what you have to do. In the center, we have this great big VU meter. It is not accurate. It is not even meant to be particularly accurate. What this reads is the total output of the device. So that's after the final mix that you've set and everything else that's happening. Uh, it's really a way of showing that there's stuff happening. If you do see this meters pinned over here solidly, then maybe you're running a little too hot, but use your ears. The input of the plugin really starts here. And that's why this knob is so central. You've got your drive input. Now, unlike most plugins, what this drive does is that it adds a little bit of saturation, so a little bit of body, a little bit of sparkle on the top end. It's not meant to get you into sounding like Megadeth or Slash or whatever, but if you push this thing hard enough, it sure will. This sets your input level. Going down to zero will quite literally cut off your input. So anywhere somewhere around here is probably gonna be about right, assuming that you're sending this as sort of a minus 12 dB signal. You send it a hotter signal, you may find that it runs a bit hot right from the beginning. Up to you entirely how you set that up. So we drive this. The big difference is that this drive affects not only the wet signal, but the dry signal. So this dry signal here is actually affected by the drive. So whatever you set as your drive signal is affecting the total output of the plugin. That is a deliberate decision and a bit unusual. The reason that this is done this way is because, A, it lets it function as a saturation unit, but that was the secondary decision, because when you combine drive plus drive with something that's else that's been done, which is another form of distortion, um, although not in the way that you think, then you end up with far more interesting results, far richer results. So we've in a sense always got a two layer of saturation happening in here. So always remember drive with a dry signal is already putting you into a saturation type situation. We can see that in the masters. That is all dry, no wet. We've got a set of filters. They are very soft filters. There are six dB, a so one pole or a six dB filter. So you can roll off the low end or the high end. Now, everything that happens in the signal here will come back to post drive. So it doesn't keep driving the signal over and over. Some plugins will, my frustration with those is that they are prone to getting unruly too fast, and that would have precluded its use as a reverb type device. So it gets one lot of drive, and then the signal flows after that drive. But it's already got some drive in it, so everything that's happening after that is moving the joys of that drive, which you then combine with the original driven signal for a much richer signal. We've got our mix controls, which you've already seen. Dry handles, that's just drive. There's no way to get a completely clean signal out of this. That's absolutely not going to happen, and that's a deliberate design. If you feel like you want to be less affected, 
pull this down, but then you're going to have to push that high. This doesn't have any gain of its own accord. So you may need to use a plug in after to lift it if you're trying to do something like still get a dry signal out of this with no drive. But you're not going to notice the drive in the sense of being distorted unless you're feeding in a signal that's that's over hot. So pull back your signal. You can add in a wet, which is the uh, affected signal, wet being driven, and then all the what's happening with our delay lines. And wide. Wide takes the wet signal and will merely narrow down the left right. So rather than them being fully hard left and hard right, it will pull them back into as much as a literal mono. This is really important because if you have too much wide happening, you'll find that it's very hard to mix things. You'll end up with just this kludge. I'm pretty sure here somewhere one of them is narrowed down to keep control. Actually, I think three of them might be narrowed down. So it's a pretty important kind of a control. And up here, we've then got our modulation. There is an LFO. There's a little bit of secret source in the LFO. It's most obvious in how it affects the first set of echoes. It's also affecting the second round, second and third round of echoes, but in a more subtle kind of a way. So you can change the rate, I can how fast this LFO wobbles, and how much it wobbles. So you can go from really quiet, slow and subtle, or slow and plenty of movement, right the way up into the ridiculous and the absurd. Uh, so if you want to emulate wows and flutters and what have you, you can do that, but it's all by ear or feel. Deliberately, nothing was labeled in this. It is designed to feel somewhat like a very old analog unit. In no way am I saying this is analog or emulates anything at all. You know, I'm not a big fan of that Ooh, look, here's my clone of a something or other. And I, I'm never kind to those in review. Uh, and so I'm not making one of those. But I'm taking the feel of a lot of these older kinds of units and the way you really had to engage with that at, at, a, at an ear and a soul level to get the results that you wanted. So that's our mix section up top. We then get into our echoes section. We've got three banks of delay. They are labeled as time one and two. They are bank one of echo. They are hard panned already, which is part of the reason why you've got your narrow of your stereo. You will also find that they're not, there's no way to control them as being exactly the same as each other. This was deliberate. I could have controlled them so that one locked to the other, but I deliberately didn't want that to be there. You can with care actually here when they're the same time or close enough to the same time. But the idea here is that we are going to end up with irregularities. If we were to build ourselves a true analog stereo delay, we would find that those two sides were never quite the same as each other. They would be wander. So you've got the ability to set these as wildly as you want in terms of left, right. You would also notice that your delay, or so your modulation, um, doesn't have the phase reversal that's quite common on these sorts of situations. If you want to widen your stereo with a, uh, a chorus or something like that, just look at moving this out slightly. Just have them slightly offset from each other, and suddenly your phase of your LFO will be kind of offset. It's not but kind of, so you will find there's there's that kind of movement anyway. In the middle, you've got a range knob or switch. It does take a little to drag this switch, just nature of the beast. So we can have a small, a medium or a large range. Small is perfect for choruses and the like. So if you're looking for something that's more in the, the chorus or very, very tight echo, then go for the small. Medium is going to be better suited to things like reverbs, early reflections, slapbacks, that sort of thing. And then long is gives you up to a full second or a thousand milliseconds of echo. And that controls 
just the slot one of your echo. You've then got slot two, which is time three. This is just locked to zero to a thousand milliseconds. You can feed it a signal which is either this signal here or the signal that's coming out of here. So you can balance anywhere between the two, which means that time three, this echo, which is mono, it's summed the two together, can be outputting as many as three taps. So it can be outputting this tap, this tap, and this tap. So we can add a lot of complexity at this point. You can keep your times very, very short for you know, early reflection-y kinds of reverbs or add into longer for multi-tap kinds of things. And then you can adjust what is sent out. Now, what it's sent out and where it's sent out to in all of these cases is that the signal goes to the wet output, the signal also goes to the bus, which is feeding this whole thing. So if this volume is fully high and we set the input to the third row of echoes, which is time four and it's offset, then we get 100% of this. But if this is low, we'll still be getting 100% of this, but its input will be quite low. It's a different way of setting up levels from the usual, but it's very deliberate and very typical for this kind of unit. So time three, long echo. Time four is zero to 250 milliseconds. So it's relatively short, but it will handle most shortish echo duties, as well as allowing you to really capitalize and build up on reflections, which is reverb. Again, we can choose whether we want the initial signal, which is just drive through to whatever's coming out of here. You can't access this except through here. So if this is set to here and you're wanting a 50-50, you may well need your knob over here. You've got to use your ears to feel this. And this is really important. It's about feel. So everybody's going to end up getting different results out of this. Set your time, and then you've got this offset. The offset, this time, is actually stereo. There's a pair of them, but the right-hand signal you can set to be a little later. So we'll get bing bing, or the other way around, bing bing. So it'll run earlier th than this time or later than this time. See how you go with it, play with it, and then you can set its output level. You're not always going to want this to be full, especially if you're trying to fill out a, uh, an early reflection or reverb type situation. Running all of these at full will give you interesting but probably less than pleasing results. But you have the ability to run these however you like. So if you're doing multi-tap delays, then definitely you can control everything that you're doing to a pretty fair extent within the limits of the system, which is ultimately driven by physics. So there's our three layers of echoes. You are going to need to spend some time playing with it, especially if you haven't used any kind of multi-tap system before. Please refer back to here and refer back to the manual. Spend some time getting your head around how it works. It's quite elegant, even if I do say so myself, in its own old school, sort of 60s, 70s kind of a way. We can then handle feedback. These feedbacks are global. They take Whatever has been sent out from these, remember they send, each one of these sends uniquely to the wet output bus, uniquely to a bus which then becomes feedback. This feedback is a straight kind of feedback. We'll just take everything and put it back into the bus that's feeding this, and therefore feeding this. If you turn your feedback up high, it will start to feed back. It will start to howl, especially if you've got a lot of drive and a lot of level. It will start to howl. Um, so do take care and make sure that you have some kind of a limiter clipper across your outputs. Not to be mixing into, because you know I don't encourage that, but to stop anything that's too nasty from going out your system. So we can feedback with a straight feedback, meaning that whatever's coming on the left side of the signal path will feed back to the left side of the signal path. 
whatever's on the right side of the signal path will feed back to the right side of the signal path. There is also a cross feed, a cross feedback, which means that it crosses its wires inside. So the left will be sent to the right and the right will be sent to the left. This is far more useful than you might think. Yes, it messes up the whole stereo signal, but so does a room. This is, this is very important in making a nice reverb, something that feels, I don't want to say real, but I'm going to say authentic. So you will find that this actually complexifies the signal even more, especially if we have a certain amount of difference between our lefts and rights in our echo settings, because the time from here and the time from here are two discrete echoes, and now they end up over there creating much more complex. Think it through, you realize you get much more complex echoes, which is what happens in a real room. So often you may find that you want a combination of both. If you turn both of these up to even about here, in a lot of situations, especially if you've got a fair amount of level from here, it will start to feed back and howl. You've got to pull back one or both of these feedbacks and start again with more subtle settings. Uh, one of these knobs alone with very little happening here will not start to feed back at all. But once you start putting the two in, and especially with level from here, you're really building a lot. So you've got to keep a sense of, okay, what's my overall output? And I hope that you have a good set of meters of pre and post in your door. I considered putting them in here, but I don't have access to meters that I trust enough to bother putting them in. So they'd be put in there just for show, which I don't think that I would want to do because I'm wasting your CPU cycle. So get meters you, you know and trust if you're really wanting to get into the balance. They are the knobs and buttons. Again, that's all covered in the paper manual as well. Now let's start looking at what we're going to do with it. So we'll go back again. This is our piece dry. Now it's wet. And as much as possible, I've tried to keep the levels the same. I know this device does not do anything in terms of level matching for you. Very deliberate. Let's see how we go. So if we turn all of these off, we will get to where we were before. We've got instance of the Hertz delay on every point, every mix point. If you follow me, you will have seen that I do this sort of thing commonly. We won't spend as much time going through these, but let's look at what we've got. If we look at our drums, solo. This is a surprising amount of echo in the bottom of this. This helps tidy it up a bit. What we're doing is we're using the drive to lift the feeling of the frequency. So rather than it speaking right down here, which is harder, it's lifting up here a little bit. The I wouldn't mind putting a compressor across this drum, but it's that great big long, long, long drum, which is, is kind of fashionable. I just went through and found something that matched my bass line. <laughs> but we're getting a nice feel in the sound. We're doing nothing but using that as a saturation, as a drive unit, just to, to lift and to also compress because our drive is also reducing the transients. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention and most of you probably won't encounter, but if you drive the output of this hard enough, as in you push this hard and you push all of this hard, there's actually a hard clipper on the output of this. Um, two reasons. One is to minimize any potential damage that could get done if you allow it to start to howl with feedback. Remember, we're not responsible for damage that, that you create, but also simply because this kind of old analog gear, it would be surprisingly clean and clear until you had really exceeded its ability and then it would go downhill, well, like rolling a car sideways off a cliff. And this is 
what will happen there. And you can use that for effect if you like. So there is another drive unit in there if you really want to break this, but we don't want that here. So, just looking to excitify what's happened with the drum kit. I think it does it nicely. Our bass. So obviously we've got a bit of drive happening here, as well as we're running this as a chorus. So good old fashioned, 80s chorus basses. But you see I've narrowed the stereo down. While it sounds lovely like this, it's very problematic in the mix because our bass is out here. And seeing we're looking for more of a rock and roll punch, we still need to narrow it in, but I don't want it to be mono. So we're allowing it to be stereo in here whilst we've got our sides out there. We're only using the first pair of these and a bit of modulation. No modulation, modulation. Our filter's just to you know, taste. We want to try to have a 50-50 on the wet and dry because it's a chorus. That's how you get the most chorusy feel. But there is nothing wrong with setting up a, a a pretty intense chorus and then backing your levels down. Absolutely nothing wrong with that at all. So so we're adding life and movement and a sense of three D ishness to our bass. So that's the pair of them. Yeah, they've got this nice, big, wet, rock and roll kind of sound to them. Now the bus. We've already got our bus and solo. This is just using this as a drive unit. Uh, normally I would use a compressor to, to groove, but this doesn't have compressor functions, but it does have that, just dealing with the transients on top. So a little bit of drive, 100% dry, no wet, just to embiggen the sound. See how that makes that feel more, more confident, more, and that's a lot of shine. And you'll see that as much as possible, all these levels are pretty well the same. So there's no marked difference as we come in and out of solo. And we have a set of guitars here. In case you're wondering, they're courtesy of the Wedge Force Matcher, which is a interesting sort of a guitar synth type thing. I've used it for a few things, it amuses me, it's so kooky. Now I've deliberately got that guitar part playing pretty loosely. It's um, not exactly the police in terms of tightness. Putting the echo on is helping to tighten it up. The, the drive is putting a little bit more sparkle on than the scream has already. We're getting that sort of sense of nice. And then we're just using the first set of echoes pulled in to be Pretty well the same as each other. I did experiment with more left right but the mix got too busy. Plus I've also to offset any of it sort of little bits of dilemma there I've narrowed the wide down. Sounds great in mono or sorry in solo to have it right out here. But create some real issues. 
in the mix because it just becomes impossible to, to, to get any sense of, of clarity. So this is why the wide knob is so important. We've got some modulation on our echo. It's quite a lot. That's sort of to taste, I guess, but I'm pushing this into the overdrive unit. And so the overdrive is, is managing the wet dry mix to some extent, and we get that really cool 60s um, spring reverb kind of feel. Second guitar, same wedge force, different line. There is a silent bit on the beginning of this. So I've gone for a longer echo overall. Again, narrowing down its width. While it sounds great like that with the really wide thing, it becomes sort of unmixable because I've got them, I think it's 60% on each side. I've I effectively never go 100% either side. I'd, it's oof, just not the right thing as far as I'm concerned. I know people do it and, you know, if we're talking ACDC, it sounds great. Um, I'm not sure with uh, with Judas Priest whether they super hard pan them or not. I mean, obviously they're out there, uh, but uh, yeah, 100% is just not a fan of you. You know, I, I want, they clearly sound like they're over there, but I want the extra side for reverb and echoes to come around for hugeness of sound. You put them right out there, you think, oh, wow, it's so wide, and you've got no hugeness, you've got no depth. Um, so... Again, not bringing in any of these. I did try it, but it just made the signal too complex seeing as going into a reverb. These are echoes, they're not reverb, but they're feeding a reverb that we bring in. Of course, no lock to sync. Again, very deliberate decision, no lock to sync. This is about feel. Uh, if you can't set a delay by ear, by feel, then you're not ready for the bigs. Um, you will not naturally lock into 100% of where a BPM sync would be, and that is good. You need to put this in in a way that it, it feels like it rolls with the sound on its own and with the piece in general, so that you will find that someone like myself who sets these by feel, I will probably be close to a beat division of some kind but I'm also managing somehow to get it to syncopate or swing a little bit. And that's where your magic comes in. So guitars. At this point, I'm using Hertz Delay as a saturator, but I'm also using it as a kind of a re-amper. So it's very, very common that when you get guitar parts that are done with an amp to mix, it's really quite common to put them through a little bit more drive. The, um, the sound that the guitarist got might be great. So it's not about saying that his, his sound sucks and he doesn't know what he's doing. There can be a great sound. But you'll find that as you embiggen the mix and look for that oversized rock and roll thing, that adding a little bit more will really make it sparkle. Drives on top of drives create a magic that you cannot comprehend until you've done it and done it right. So that little bit of drive that we've got here is actually really sparking up, not only giving more body, but a little bit more shred to the front end. So it's not it's prob it's probably give giving us more RMS level because it will be shaving off some of those transients. Um, 
as to exactly 100% how close we are, we're close enough in terms of level. So that's the, the big advantage on that one. And then we come to our synth. <laughs> Now this is an analog style and it is designed very broadly speaking to feel a little bit like a something like a mini. Uh, it's already got lots of movement in it, but I'll notice as we bring this in, in, in echoes, We're putting a lot of body and movement into that sound. Now, setting up the echoes and balance on this took a few goes. It was important to get this in the right place in the mix. The guitars are not the lead of this mix. This synth is the lead in the mix. While I wanted it to be very, very full and, and chorusy, reverby, what have you, the problem was that it ended up sounding kind of like it was behind the drums. So we had drums and guitars and then this synth, my mix was backwards. Turning up the synth doesn't solve that, it merely becomes like this, which is not what we want to do. We want that synth to be in front, it's like the singer. So we've got synth, guitars, drums in the order in which they feel good, um, or at least good to me. You can do whatever you want in your mix, but depth is super important. So finding the times and the balance at which point we get what we want. So, quite a lot going on here. We pull out the mix dry. We've got our first set of times, our, del our echoes. The second one, which is um, around the same place as the first. So they are kind of working together with each other using a combination of this initial signal, what we will call the dry signal, um, with that little bit of drive, and what's coming off of here. So there's going to be some kind of chorusing happening there as well, but we're not outputting a full level. We're then taking, I don't know what that would be, let's loosely call it half and half of this and this into our time four, which is actually fairly short. Remember, that's only 250 milliseconds. Both of these are set to a, up to a to a range of a thousand. This is locked at 250, so it's quite short. So that's echoes and a reasonable amount of offset. So we're getting a lot of width here from sliding consistency on these and uh, a fair amount of inconsistency between left to right on these. Again, kept lowish in the mix so that they're not going to overdo it and mostly just straight feedback because I really did want to separate out the width here. I was pushing for, for width on this one. So we get... This beautiful, fat, analog synth type sound coming out of here. In the mix... Notice how, and you can't hear this properly in headphones, you can't hear depth in headphones, uh, but with good speakers you'll notice how that when everything's dry, like if we go back to here, everything feels quite flat and papery. Yeah, there's left, right, but it's flat and papery. Once we switch on, got a lot of depth, a lot of width, a lot of sense of, oh, there's this great big round universe that this piece is happening in. And that's all from one device. So that's our synth done. We will actually just go through and uh, switch these off and then back on again. And then we will look at what's been done to the uh, reverb and the masters. So dry. Yeah.
hear how as each one of these comes in, the mix grows just that little bit more. We're never looking to take one sound and make it bigger than um, bigger than Ben Hur. Uh, we're taking one little bit at a time, and collectively we end up with this hugeness. There is a reverb in here, so this shows the Hertz delay as a reverb. <laughs> Here is our reverb. We've got mid timing here. These two are kept fairly close to each other. A little bit of drive. We've got some low and high pass because we don't want that reverb to seem too. And while we can take a fair amount off here and get quite a bright reverb, I still wanted this to feel full so I didn't take too much off the low end. A reasonable amount of modulation happening here. So that gives us a nice sense of movement and richness and depth to the whole piece. We are taking most of this into time three, which is quite short. Uh, I mean, that would be in the hundred or so milliseconds, I guess. Not outputting too much level there. We're taking again most of this, although bearing in mind this is low, we'd be getting a fair amount of that. Still in terms of even and a little bit of time here. So if that's 125, so it's about 60 or so milliseconds. So that's still in the, the, the reverb-ish kind of time, um, a reasonable amount of offset, and then mixing it in, combination of the two straight and cross feedbacks, technically slightly more cross feedback, to create that sense of a room that's, that's propagating itself. And we've actually narrowed down the width. Look at this. While that seems good, we've also got a sense of a hole in the middle, which is not nice, because when we put that into the mix, let's just pop that back in. I can't hear that in headphones at all. I can't hear any change there. But with speakers, there was quite a noticeable sense of what happened. We ended up with a lot of clutter on the sides and this kind of weird hole in the middle. By pulling it back in, we had this big body of, of reverb filling that space between sort of our bass and kick and our guitars, which are out on the side. There is still reverb coming through those sides. Uh, but we don't have them cluttered, so they're clear. You listen to um, ACDC's Hell's Bells and how the guitars come in, they're so clear, but that's not a reverbless mix. Uh, and, of course, it's picking up what it's being fed from, particularly the synth, and in beginning that as well. So collectively, we end up with a really big, rich sound. <laughs> Again, it will be more noticeable on speakers than it will in cans. So that's our reverb. And then we come to the masters. This one, because of managing levels, uh, I've put the AB onto another switch because we need to make sure the levels come out right. This is not designed as a mastering tool, but hell or high water, I was going to show it doing everything. <laughs> It's adding body to the signal. Uh, the levels are actually uh, a bit lower, but um, overall, our peak levels are the same. So I think RMS have grown, which is what we would hope for in this situation using a drive. Um, and the tone is nice. It's adding a nice gloss. Now there is no EQ, no compression, no anything that we might use at this time just to, you know, foofy up our piece. Everything that you hear from here to here is just 
hertz delay. So as you see, the one device, once you understand how it's operating, will allow you to do an awful lot of things. I'm not saying you put it on your masters, but I'm not saying don't put it on your masters because it does actually work. You may just need to finesse your levels after uh, because once you start pushing more drive and you will start to hear particularly hi-hats and things like that will start to break up, which if that's what you're after, fine, but I think it would be a little, well, less than ideal, <laughs> at least from my perspective. But I'm pretty confident that if I were to put in um, just a nice little bit of mastering EQ, a little bit of top, um, probably not on the bottom, but just sort of pull out something in the in the mids there, we'd probably end up with a very, very nice sounding mix, bearing in mind all the material. So again, just notice that massive difference between the mix that's fully dry and the mix that's got lots of lovely echo on it. Now remember that the way I tend to work is that I will set up my reverb space first. It's actually that one technically, uh, which means that everything that I do here in terms of creating echoes for things is actually feeding the reverb. So while the reverb may sound a little sparse on its own, once it's being fed echoes from other instruments, they all compound. And so that's essentially all the reverb unit is, is lots and lots of echo units. But the complexity of, say, this plus this really expands the sound of what we've got. So if we take just this synth, Yeah, how it becomes bigger and richer and more spaced, as in put in space, just with that delay. If you have any questions about the functioning of the device, first port of call obviously is please read the manual. If you have questions about the usage of the device, pop them down below, preferably after hitting subscribe, because it's really important to return value. You're getting this at no, no dollar cost, whereas there's been quite a bit of dollar cost to hire Hertz to set this up uh, and a vast amount of my time and of course experience as well. If you're asking for help with your mix, number one, should you really be paying? And I do this for a living. Um, or at least make sure that we are seeing and hearing as much as is possible as though this were in, well, you're asking me, so my studio, which means Use OBS or something similar, I scream. I think there's actually something within Windows or if you're Apple afflicted, which means you can't run this device, but if you are Apple afflicted, I'm sure they have their own screen recorder that you can just record what's going on in your screen. Let me see what's happening and hear exactly what's happening and explain clearly what it is that, that's bothering you because I may listen to it and go, why is, why is that a bother at all? So you may be worrying yourself about nothing. I get quite a few of those. And to be fair, I've probably fired a few of those off to, uh, to support engineers like staff <laughs> and who've come back and gone, yeah, why are we worrying about this? But it's great to get that kind of feedback. So the really important thing is, here is the device. It is a fascinating device with a lot of depth, and a lot of things that you can do with it once you get your head around with it. Take the time, play with it, really get your head around it. If you're struggling to feel comfortable with these, turn their levels down, take them out of the game, get comfortable with this bit and it's mixing. And then you'll go, oh, what if I did this? Oh, what if I did this? Learn it bit by bit until you get really comfortable with how it thinks and feels because it is a real character device. Um, and most importantly, have fun.